slides are up. Great. Hi, everyone. Great to be in person. Great to see everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Adam Kraft. I work at Google. And the work I'm presenting today is the work of many, many other people uh, at Google. So the topic is, where are we with AutoML? Hopefully today you will learn a little about, about uh, what AutoML is in general, where it can be used. Um, and yeah, happy to take questions at the end. All right, so if we look at the progress of AI over many, many decades, uh, in the beginning, people kind of took very simple programs that they hard-coded their own rules and, and different predictions into the program and made things that looked smart. Um, and that was sort of called AI in the beginning. But nothing was actually really learned or updated. It was all just humans putting their intuitions into programs. And then eventually people came around and said, hey, you know, statistical methods can do well where uh, we can actually take data and learn these shallow algorithms. Uh, but in these cases, a lot of things were handcrafted. Like if you had images, you had to figure out ways how to divide them into features, so handcrafted features. Same with things like text, like engrams, uh, different ways to characterize your data. And then eventually, as we all know, in the past decade or so, deep learning came about, which was really great because uh, it learned the, the data end to end where you have the data feeding in, it's doing feature extraction and the algorithm. And we're getting great results, a lot of companies uh, getting, getting good results. But there's still a lot of handcrafted pieces. So figuring out different tuning parameters for your algorithm, what architecture you're gonna use, what data pre-processing you're gonna do, uh, as you all are probably pretty familiar, a lot of things that people do day to day are still pretty involved in terms of human intuition being baked into the algorithm and making a lot of decisions. So as we look forward, and we're already seeing progress now, how can we reduce a lot of this human intuition and just do everything end to end? So really reduce the number of hyperparameters, the things that you have to think about and let everything from the algorithm, the, the the features that it's, it's extracting, the architecture, all these high level things just happen end to end. And that's sort of the idea of AutoML. So why is this important? Well, as we all know, there's lots of data in the world, lots of organizations that have problems that, that need solving with, that can be used with AI. And as we all kind of know from the job, mar job market, there's a really big demand for being able to solve these problems uh, and we can all kind of agree that there's just really not enough people to satisfy the demand. Also, you could argue people that, you know, are able to train these algorithms and models don't want to spend all their time tuning these hyperparameters and just tweaking little things as opposed to really thinking big picture about their problem, their data, how can they solve the problems at a high level and not focus on the small details of the, of the, of the learning algorithm. Uh, further than the demand, AutoML can actually give you really good results, state of the art. In some cases, so these are ImageNet results over the years with different models, AutoML has been shown to actually outperform a lot of the human ML experts. And we've seen this trend continue into other areas beyond computer vision. So where can we use AutoML? If you think about your machine learning pipeline in a very simplified view, you have your data and you have some pipeline to pre-process it, filter it, maybe do some augmentation, and then you have your modeling, which nowadays a lot of people use deep learning, so you have neural networks. Um, and then on top of that, you have some sort of optimization algorithm that allows you to, to train this thing. And the answer is that AutoML can essentially be used in all of these components, either focusing in on them or also trying to focus on all of them together. For instance, in the data processing world, Pipeline. Um, if you're doing computer vision or, or text, you may have some sort of augmentation. And the idea of augmentation is to allow your data set to grow larger or to have your model see different cases that it can generalize better. And humans started doing some kind of seemingly funky things with, with data pre-processing and augmentation. Uh, but you can also apply AutoML to that. So using AutoML to say, hey, help me find what is the best augmentation for my problem. And in this case, for ImageNet, it found some interesting um, processes for, for augmentation that actually outperform previous methods 
And it's kind of these very bizarre patterns that humans may not necessarily think are, are, are good for their problem. And we've seen this generalized to, to other areas as well with, uh, with, with video, with uh, object detection, with, with text and speech. The big case for AutoML, um, for those who may have heard of AutoML, oftentimes it's categorized just with learning the architecture. So the breakthrough algorithm in the paper was neural architecture search, where AutoML was used to essentially find different architectures as opposed to humans having to go in and, and figure out all the different layers and all the connections. So on the left is an early paper showing if you can allow the AutoML algorithm to learn these different connections or the depth of the, of the network, if it learns some, you could say, non-intuitive things, and it ends up getting good results. You can also, a lot of people have spent a lot of uh, time and effort on other areas for neural architecture search. So on the right, it's kind of showing, instead of looking at uh, the whole network, it's what if you look at smaller decisions within the network, different convolution blocks, different connections. Um, so, you, so, so neural architecture search and AutoML have been applied to many different areas of finding the best architecture. And then on the, oh, I guess not the slide. Um, so, so going forward, so how does AutoML work? I showed you some examples of what it can do, but that really doesn't, you know, it sounds like this magical thing. So let's look a little bit deeper into what AutoML is and how it works. So in a nutshell, this is a very simplified view. If you think of, I have this problem I'm working on, this data set, this task I want to achieve well, you can think of AutoML as taking that task, pointing it as the inner loop, and then using an outer loop, which is trying to decide how to best choose the, the parameter choices for that inner loop. And you can kind of think of this as sort of what humans do. You know, you're sitting down, you have a problem, you train some models, you get some feedback, and you say, oh yeah, based on these parameters I chose, this is what I learned, but I think if I, you know, change my architecture or change some of the learning parameters, I think I can get better results. So that's essentially what the goal of AutoML is, where you add this controller that is doing that feedback loop for you. So let's dig a little bit deeper into some of these components. So the controller itself uh, can be different, there's different options. On a very simplistic version, I guess you wouldn't really call it automated ML, but um, maybe you've even written a program where you just have a grid search or random parameters. You, you have some parameter space you want to explore, and you just have a program that loops over and, and looks at all those, those options. On the more sophisticated side, you have things like reinforcement learning, evolution, or gradient-based methods. And those themselves have uh, different learning parameters in order to uh, essentially update its beliefs about what it thinks the, the best parameters are over time. One of the key components of AutoML is, you know, we talked about reducing the parameter space of, of, of what the human has to choose, but you still sort of have to define what are the parameters that your new program is allowed to search over. It's, you know, it's not currently just here's my problem, tell me everything for me, but you do have to define some parameters of, uh, you know, within the architecture, these are the different things I want you to try. And you can make the search phase very, very large, and you can make it so large that it's essentially infeasible to try every parameter or for you as a human to really explore that space. Um, so what is, you know, some examples of, of the parameter choices are if you're thinking about a convolutional neural network, how many convolution Filters should I have in a particular layer? How big should the filters be? Um, for any neural network, like how many layers? How should I connect them? Um, if you're thinking about different areas of the augmentation, the, the pre-processing pipeline, what augmentations should I use? So these are all things that you can explore and, and set up so that your program can search over these. And then the feedback uh, is usually pretty straightforward in terms of you know for your task, what are you trying to optimize? It could be some you know, metric that's uh, like accuracy, MIOU, something that's very well defined within uh, the machine learning or statistical world. It could also be depending uh, on your business needs, your business uh, high level metrics or goals that you're trying to optimize. So that can actually be part of the feedback 
that you're telling the AutoML controller. Because what you're gonna do is you're gonna run this inner loop potentially many times, and you wanna be able to give some feedback to the controller so the, the controller can update its beliefs about what the best parameters are. And on that note, so something that really helps AutoML is adding specific constraints for either memory or runtime or number of parameters. So a little bit more on that. Um, if you think about it, if you have a search space that says, hey, I want you to explore all these different parameters, different number of layers, different uh, connections, and I wanna get some, some high level metric, and I want the best, you know, best accuracy or, or, or some metric. Uh, you can imagine that oftentimes the AutoML or, or you as a human, if you want the best results, you just use a larger network, right? So if you don't have any constraints for AutoML, you know, it could also, the, the controller could also say, hey, when I run this over and over, I find that the best results I'm getting are when I choose these really expensive choices. So you have to think about that um, a little bit more. But the good news is that you can essentially take different constraints for your you know, business needs, whether it's, you know, I'm running this on some device, I need uh, some sort of number of flops, or it could be, in some cases, if you even have a, a, a way for a specific hardware that you care about, if you have a way to actually either, you know, look up the table for, oh, this network is gonna run at this speed, or even, sorry, if you even test it out, if you, if you run, say, here's a model that I trained, I run it on this hardware, and you can actually get, you know, live feedback of how, how quickly it runs, you can use that as a part of your reward function. And that's really sort of a key component when it comes to AutoML of optimizing for very specific uh, use cases and, and, and business needs. So what about cost? Um, so in the, in the picture that I drew, we have this inner loop, which you are working on for your task, and then there's this outer loop. And it sounds like I'm asking people here to write a program that can run this outer loop many times, and that could really explode in terms of the computational needs. Um, well, so first of all, part of the purpose of AutoML is that the, the controller that you choose is able to search that big search space better than a human. So it actually is you know, updating statistical beliefs about what parameters are better. There's also some practical tasks you can do. So for instance, uh, if I have this one task I'm working on and I wanna explore using AutoML, I can try to make that inner loop smaller for AutoML where I can maybe slightly reduce the, the data set size or, or don't let it train quite as long because really what I'm looking for are the best parameters. And then once you know, AutoML kind of tells me hey, these are the best parameters, then I can take those and go back and do the full-scale data set, full-scale training for as long as I want to really get the best result. Um, there's other cases where uh, you can also do things like early stopping, you know, train, train uh, a little bit less. Um, and then the big thing that, you know, I didn't really have time to dig into today is that, so right now this, this double loop, we, we usually call that uh, multi-trial AutoML where you're running multiple trials. So you're, you're doing multiple rounds of that inner loop training, you're getting some feedback, and you're gonna do that over and over again. There are also methods where we call them one-shot training. So in that case, what happens is you're training your model once, and you're updating the controller while you train that single model, and it's trying to update its beliefs. And the way that that works is you actually, you can do it where you train for some short number of steps, and then you, uh, you take some feedback reward based on what you've just tried, and then you update your, your controller. So you're doing it sort of in line, and that can really reduce your costs, but you know, it's sometimes hard to set up that, that, that training framework. Uh, but that is a, if cost is an important key, then that's uh, a really good way to do that. I'll end today with where are we headed with AutoML? So, uh, AutoML in the past few years has you know, first done really good, uh, uh, gotten really good results with computer vision. We're now seeing it with NLP. We're also seeing it with practical use cases uh, like you know, some sort of tabular data or recommender systems that, that AutoML is able to go beyond just the, the flashy ImageNet data sets and really do well in other real world applications. I think that's sort of uh, a key for the next few years of where we're going with AutoML. 
Um, second bullet point is, is, is definitely cheaper. Uh, you know, the first iterations of AutoML were large, expensive, used lots of compute. So how can we um, essentially make AutoML, you know, improve the algorithms in a way that it can actually make it easier for, you know, needing less data or less compute, um, but also needing less ML experts. So as, as AutoML sort of grows, um, the, the goal is, you know, not to replace machine learning practitioners, but really help them, really, you know, instead of spending your time tweaking these little parameters, how can you spend more of your time on the bigger picture, on, on, on other needs of your you know, day to day, your research, your business. And then um, along those lines is also so more accessible. So, you know, AutoML is still definitely in the early stages of, you know, having good libraries and support and infrastructure. Um, the good news is that we're seeing some offerings from companies, we're seeing some open source libraries. So I think this will continue to grow and make it a lot more accessible for, for, for people. And, uh, and again, going back to allowing it to be cheaper and also expand to new applications. All right, um, thank you so much. That's the end of my talk. Um,